<laughs> so, Crystal, I, uh, I tested this um, at the beginning of service and left my phone there, and it shut off on me, and now the program's not running. So I'm going to give it a shot. Look at that. Come on. You know you want to. So I'm going to point at you. <laughs> I don't know why I bother. <laughs> so uh, thankfully, there's only 10 slides. So it should be pretty simple. And I'll go, or I'll do this. Or My daughter, Crystal, has stepped in to volunteer to work the computer so that you all can see what I'm talking about, so you all can read the words and all that stuff. And uh, she likes to point out whenever I make mistakes. It's awesome. It's great. It's great. Thanks for doing that, honey. Today is uh, part four of our Advent series that we're calling Gift Exchange. Uh, it's, it's still really weirding me out a little bit. I'm glad we actually have some snow now because what was it? Thursday was what, like 15, 16 degrees out. It was like summertime again. I don't know what was going on, but it really didn't help, you know, with this whole weird thing I've got going on where I feel like, like Christmas is still a couple of weeks away. It just seems odd to me. Uh, but I'm actually very excited about it. In this series, we've been talking about how we kind of have this gift exchange going on with God where he's always sort of trading things off in our lives. Like the things that, that he doesn't want a part of our lives, things that are of the world, that sort of stuff. He's sort of trading those things out and replacing them with the things of his kingdom. And as I've been mentioning each week, every time I think about this gift exchange, I'm reminded by uh, this incredible passage in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3, which says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I love the beauty of that passage. It has always spoken to me greatly, and it, it, even more so now, and it's one of the reasons why I've been reading this passage each week as we've done this, uh, because this is really who God is. Remember, he's not just uh, a rescuing God. He's, he's, he's a redemptive God. He's a transformational God. He's a God that doesn't just take out the ugly things from our lives. He takes out those things, and he replaces them instead with light and that's my kind of gift exchange. And as much as Advent is a season of preparation for us, it's also a season of celebration. It's a season where we celebrate all that we have in Christ. So it's a time for us to acknowledge this incredible and glorious gift exchange that we have with God through Him. So this season, what we've been doing is we've been taking a look at some of the specific gift exchanges that we have with God in this particular season. And today... We are going to be talking about exchanging hate for love. This was an interesting message to write. And I, I mulled on it for weeks in advance. I had already prepared what it was that I was going to talk about. I had no idea how I was going to get there. And as I thought about this, what I found really interesting, the more I focused and prayed about this particular exchange is the realization that this particular gift exchange that we have with God is really all about forgiveness. And I know that at first that might sound a little weird to you, and believe me, I get it, but the truth is, is that if we are actually to give over our hate and everything that's connected to hate and in, in, instead exchange it for the kingdom of God and His love, then we have to understand that on our end, that begins in forgiveness. And that's because it's a lack of forgiveness that actually poisons a person's heart. And it usually sends people spiraling into hostility and even hate. Unforgiveness is the catalyst for hate. As Worthington and Shearer wrote in the medical journal Psychology and Health, 
Unforgiveness is not just the absence of forgiving. It is a complex combination of delayed negative emotions. And in the Handbook of Forgiveness, Harrison Thornson wrote, the complex delayed negative emotions of unforgiveness create stress reactions and sustained delayed negative emotions like resentment, bitterness, hostility, hatred, anger, and fear towards the transgressor. But the Bible has a lot to say about unforgiveness too. Matthew 18, 23-35, for example, tells us that if we don't forgive people, we are turned over to the torturers. Mark 11, 22-26 clearly teaches us that unforgiveness hinders our faith from working. And in Matthew 16 and 15, Jesus clearly said, If you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you. That's huge. And I don't know about you, but it's these kinds of, when I see these kinds of things in Scripture, just my soul just goes, oh my goodness, what am I missing then and what do I need to do? So again, in exchanging hate for love, the key is really all about forgiveness, something that we should all be working in. That's where it begins. That's kind of the, the fork in the road, as you were. That's where choices are made because we have to choose a path. That's where we're, we're giving up this world for the kingdom of God. And that's because when we refuse to give, we choose, and when we choose that path, we're actually choosing selfishness and forcing, forcing others beneath us. On the other hand, when we choose forgiveness, it brings freedom for both parties. It, it births compassion in our hearts. It, forgiveness strengthens relationships, all relationships, and it moves us in the will of God. So I guess the real question we, we should be asking this morning is, how are we with forgiveness? I mean, is this one of those characteristics that you, you find easy to deal with? You find it easy to forgive people? Or, or is it you know, one of those virtues that you struggle with the most? When you think of what it means to forgive people, what is it that's stirred up in your mind and your heart? One of the inescapable truths about the birth of Jesus is that ultimately he came to reconcile us to God. He came exposed and vulnerable to bridge the relationship between us and our Creator so that through Him we would be forgiven and made right with God. I mean, that's how it all started, really. Advent is a great opportunity for us to explore forgiveness as an expression of God's love and to reflect on our own appropriate responses to God's forgiveness. So let's begin this morning by reading Matthew in chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, which says this. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph... Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Whether we like to admit it or not, forgiveness is something that we're all going to have to deal with. Forgiveness is something that impacts every person everywhere. We all need forgiveness. We all need to forgive. The subject of forgiveness can, be, can stir up all kinds of different emotions, powerful, uh, positive emotions when forgiveness leads to reconciliation, or powerful negative emotions when forgiveness is withheld and relationships remain broken. Our passage today combines both of those experiences. And it's important for us to reflect and focus on forgiveness because each of us is going to face this over and over again in our lifetime. We will have moments when we need to seek forgiveness for ourselves. And we're going to have moments when we need to offer forgiveness to the people in our lives. So today, let's look at how the gift of Jesus helps make us forgiving people and forgiven people. So that in this gift exchange, we find that gift of love. 
The first thing I want to consider this morning that we should all be thinking about is forgiveness combines judgment and empathy. And I know that seems like a bit of a mouthful. It's a very wordy point, but I think this is an important one. Forgiveness combines judgment and empathy. Verse 21 says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I want you to think for a second about the language that you use in the context of forgiveness. Right? Many times, a response to an apology, people will say, oh, you know, it's okay, don't worry about it. You know, don't think anything. It's nothing. It's nothing, right? And while the intention when we say stuff like that is is to actually receive that that request for forgiveness or the apology, uh, those words, when we say stuff like that, can actually dismiss it. If an apology is necessary, and hear this, this is important. If an apology is necessary, then there is something wrong to forgive. <laughs> yes? But while yeah. forgiveness assumes that there is a wrong action or a wrong attitude that needs to be forgiven. So forgiveness is a kind of judgment, right? We're weighing something. Forgiveness is a kind of judgment, but it is not a condemnation. So it's actually kind of a paradox, because forgiveness is actually that blend between judgment and compassion. The counselor Stephen Sandage uh, once wrote, Forgiving empathy or compassion is the capacity to become aware of the suffering and weakness of our offenders while still holding them responsible for moral wrongdoing. You know, in the birth of Jesus, God blends judgment and empathy. The saving and forgiving act of God doesn't dismiss or ignore our sin, not at all. But rather, it's a declaration that human beings must be saved from our sin. But remember, it's also an action that doesn't leave us in our sins either. It rather, it identifies with us in our weakness. What I mean by all of this is that forgiveness is not about pretending that everything is all right. It's about a judgment made on a debt, declaring it paid in full. So it's a decision that's made to no longer hold the person accountable for repayment. In essence, it's it's taking that debt onto ourselves, because that's what happens, right? When you forgive a financial debt, you kind of eat that, right? You eat it yourself. And that's what God did in the forgiveness that we receive through Christ. He took that debt onto himself. You and I have a very clear command to forgive. Nowhere, nowhere does it say that it's going to be an easy thing to do, but it is clear that we are to do it, and it is clear that we benefit from doing it. When someone owes us something, it, we can be very emotional about it. And so we need to kind of get out of our own heads, get out of our own hearts, and stop thinking about ourselves and look to that situation with compassion and decide to do what's right to make the judgment to forgive. Forgiveness is made possible through compassion for the other person and passing the judgment of forgiveness, despite what our feelings may have to say about it. It's a choice, really. This is that fork in the road that we talked about. This is the decision is made. you got to choose which path you're going to walk. So what, what will you choose this Christmas? Will you choose to forgive? Will you choose to set aside your own feelings of being owed someone, uh, something rather? Will you love and look upon those around you with compassion and pass judgment for their freedom and for yours? Will you forgive this Christmas? Because Christmas can be a little messy sometimes, can't it? This is how we trade hate for love, walking in this forgiveness. Another thing we should consider this morning is that forgiveness creates vulnerability. And this is kind of important because if you're not really aware of this stuff, this can catch you off guard, this one, if you're not expecting it. Forgiveness creates vulnerability. Verse 18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Again, forgiveness creates vulnerability. It would be good if we could all remember that love itself, the very act of loving someone, is to be vulnerable. 
In fact, it has been, I've heard it said before, we probably could all say that it is impossible to actually love someone without making ourselves vulnerable. The forgiving act of God in Jesus begins with an extremely vulnerable act. I mean, let's face it, nothing in all of life is more helpless than a newborn baby. Right? A newborn is completely dependent on others for its survival. In the saving, forgiving act of God in Christ, God took an incredibly vulnerable form in being born as a baby. In this act, God identifies with both the forgiver and the forgiven. First, God identifies with the forgiver. He understands how we feel when we've been wronged and a death has been incurred. He can relate to your disappointment, to your pain, to your frustrations. But not only does the Lord identify with the forgiver, God is the forgiver. The vulnerability of God in the helpless baby Jesus helps us see the vulnerability, the, the exposure, the insecurity that we ourselves feel when we're having to forgive others. In the Lord's Prayer, we're taught to pray that God will forgive us just like we forgive others. I mean, isn't it amazing that God never asks us to do anything that he hasn't already experienced himself? It's incredible. God identifies with the forgiver. But secondly, God also identifies with the forgiven. I mean, have you ever, have you ever asked for forgiveness in kind of a serious and painful situation where you were at fault? Mm. Not only does the forgiver feel vulnerable in that situation, but the one seeking forgiveness can feel pretty vulnerable too. Theologian Jorgen uh, Moltzen writes, When we admit our guilt, we render ourselves defenseless, assailable, and vulnerable. Well, when, when God became a man in the person of Jesus, God became defenseless, assailable, and vulnerable as well. He can relate to vulnerability, all the vulnerability that we're going to experience in this lifetime in being forgiven. And I don't know if you've heard this before, but vulnerability is the very thing that builds the bridges of reconciliation. It builds bridges in relationship. Vulnerability is essential in forgiveness. There's a story I heard once about um, two brothers who lived on adjoining farms. And after more than 40 years of living and working side by side like that, uh, something happened and they got into a fight. Things were done. Stuff was said. And when the dust settled, everything had fallen apart and the two men stopped talking to each other, furious with one another. And then one morning, quite some time later, there's a knock at the older brother's door and he opens it to find a man standing there with a carpenter's toolbox. And the man uh, explains to the farmer that he's just traveling around. He's looking for a few days work and hoped that the farmer might have some odd jobs that he could do. And the older brother didn't hesitate. He says, I sure do. You see that, see that creek bed over there? On the other side of that creek is my brother's farm. What I want you to do is I want you to build me a wall 10 feet high so I don't have to look at his place or look at his face ever again. And the carpenter paused. He says, I think I understand what you need. And if you just show me where the nails and the post hole digger are, I'll, I'll get to work right away. And the farmer did. He took him out back and he showed him where everything was. And then he went off into town for the day while the carpenter worked. And the carpenter worked. He worked hard all day long, measuring, sawing, nailing. And by just about sunset, when the farmer finally returned home, the carpenter had just finished his job. And when the farmer saw the work that the carpenter had done, his eyes opened wide and his jaw dropped. You see, instead of the wall that he had asked for, in its place was a beautiful bridge extending from his property over the creek and down onto the property of his brother. And as he stood there in disbelief, he sees his brother coming across the bridge with his arms stretched wide, saying, Oh, brother, I can't believe that you would build this bridge after everything I've said and done. Will you forgive me? Come to my home for supper tonight, that we might be brothers again. And the two brothers met in the middle of the bridge, and they took each other's hands, and their relationship came back together after all that time. And as they did that, they, they turned to see the carpenter hoisting his toolbox onto his shoulder and preparing to leave. And the older brother said, no, wait, stay a few days. I've got lots of projects for you to do. To which the carpenter replied, I'd love to stay, but I have many more bridges to build. 
right? I love that story. It is a great story of how, uh, of the demonstration that vulnerability is essential in forgiveness. It offers and allows the other person grace. It puts aside the threat that would keep us apart. Being vulnerable simply lets the other person see that you're willing. And it's only scary before you step into it. Vulnerability is the key to building bridges in relationship, all relationships. So will you let yourself be vulnerable this Christmas? Will you allow yourself to be vulnerable through the forgiveness and and build bridges of trust with the people in your life? Loving forgiveness creates vulnerability and it builds love in our hearts. That's how we exchange hate for love. Now the last thing I want to talk about this morning that we should be considering is that forgiveness makes relationship possible. Verses 22 and 23 say this, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, ultimately, what God intended with his offer of forgiveness was relationship. That's the whole point of it, is relationship. God wanted to be with us, and he came to be with us in Jesus. Jesus is not simply an act of God. He is God come to be with us. The theologian Greg Jones describes forgiveness this way. He says, forgiveness is not so much a word spoken, an action performed, or a feeling felt, as it it is an embodied way of life in an ever-deepening relationship with the triune God and with others. In Jesus, God takes on flesh to embody forgiveness, to be friends with us. It's amazing when you think about it. But just as Joseph initially intended to set Mary aside and the unborn child with her, we too can reject the relationship that God offers. Many people are still this day rejecting Jesus. This reminds us that forgiveness does not create relationship It only makes relationship possible. And this should shape our own practices of forgiveness. A long time ago, uh, I had a friend named Gary. Uh, He was, is, an incredibly talented guy. Very creative. An amazing guitarist. uh, Perhaps the greatest songwriter I have ever known in my life. He was my best friend, and I loved him dearly. Still do. In fact, we... uh, did everything together. We wrote music together. We played together. We were even roommates for a very short time. Um, But one day we had a fight. It was a big one. Uh, We never fought. And then one day there was this blowout. And it was over something stupid and meaningless, ultimately. But we were both entrenched. We were both wrong. And we both said things in anger that were both cruel and painful. And our relationship blew apart. In time, I admitted my fault, and I went to him. I humbled myself. I forgave him his part, and I asked him for his forgiveness. In turn, he lashed out at me again as if it had just happened yesterday. Uh, And to this very day, he is still quite angry with me. And truth is, I get it. He hurts still a lot. I used to live that way too before I knew Christ. It's a shame, but it is a really good illustration to me that forgiveness can only make relationship possible. It can't make it happen. I still have hope in my heart, but as I said, he's really hurt, and I accept that we may never reconcile. Forgiveness always makes relationship possible, but it doesn't make it happen. The question is, Crystal, the question is, will you allow for that possibility to be created? Christmas is a time of possibility. Christmas time is also a time of family. And I don't know about you, but my family can be a little difficult at times. It's possible that you might have some situations this Christmas. I don't know. I don't know what it's like for you. But it is possible. So you need to ask yourself, will you be the one in that difficult situation to have compassion Judge people with forgiveness. Judge them free of that debt. 
Let yourself be vulnerable and make relationship possible. Because that, when we do that, that is a trade off. Giving away the hate that is in this world and instead living in a place of love. And that's how that gift exchange begins. I'm going to invite the worship team to join me back up. We're going to do a closing song, but I'd like to pray for everybody first. I'd like my water first (laughs) before I pray. I didn't know I was going to wind up preaching about forgiveness today when I when I was planning out my sermon schedule. I knew what I wanted to do as far as the gift exchange, but it was the Holy Spirit that really put this on my heart, and I'm kind of glad he did. As odd as, as it was as I was writing this, it seems like a strange thing to be preaching at Christmas time because it's not always what we're thinking of at Christmas. But forgiveness is so big, and I don't know what experiences you may have had in your life with forgiving people or unforgiveness or whatever, But there is few things, or there are few things in this world that are more important to living in the right path, to living as a disciple of Jesus, than always having forgiveness in your heart. And so I invite you to be vulnerable this Christmas. Whatever the situation, I know sometimes that can be scary, especially when the other person's pretty aggressive. But forgiveness is his way. We want to live his way. We don't want to be justified because we feel that we're right. I used to say all the time, I know Tracy's heard me say this a million times, I'm sure, but sometimes it just boils down to one question. Do I want to be right or do I want to be in relationship? Yeah? I pray for all of us, Father, that whatever is to happen this Christmas, whatever road we're walking, whatever people we may see, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would have forgiveness first and foremost in our heart. That love would be the way we handle every situation. That you would give us everything we need, every, every word, every ounce of courage, Father, every bit of boldness. That you would give us uh, the, the moments, you would give us the, the noticing the moments that in everything that will happen, Father, that you would abound. That your love would triumph that we would live in the place of forgiveness as you have demonstrated to us first. I love, Lord, that your your word um, says to us that we love because you first loved us. And so I pray that you would go ahead of us, that in every every way you would make that way possible for us, Father. I pray your blessing on everyone here, everyone who will hear this message later, Father. I just pray that this would be made solid in their heart that it would become who we are as the children of God. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.